Hey, I thought on the intro today I'm going to do like one of those like coming at you bro kind of throw at the camera kind of things and then you catch it and then we'll do that. So let's like, you know, like I'll do like a crazy punch or something like, bah! <laughs> oh shit. Welcome to Questions Over Coffee. I can assure you no coffee was damaged in the making of that intro. It's still in the bag, and good to go. It did not split open. So, drinking a Voca again, local Fort Worth roaster. Check them out if you're interested in a coffee subscription or some coffee. Uh, that's what we buy here for the office. Really good stuff. Anyway, first question today is about loadout bags, if you couldn't tell already with this big loadout bag here. Um, we got a question over email that came from Joe who asked, can you recommend some options for deployment or loadout bag? I'm searching for a bag that can hold all the necessary equipment, plate carrier, chest rig, battle belt, boots, outerwear, weapons, etc. So um, I wanted to start with my recommendation uh, based on a few, of, few loadout bags that I have that I'll show you as well. But I wanted to talk through why I kind of keep coming back to this particular bag from LBT or London Bridge Trading. And Partly it's because it's not only a roller bag, so if you look on the bottom here, it's got wheels. Um, not only because it's a roller bag, but because it's a smaller roller bag. So this is, let's see, I'll start with this. So this is another LBT roller bag. And you can see how much bigger this is uh, width-wise than the bag underneath it. So you're not really, I guess, yeah, the dimension is very similar, and you know, forgive me, I don't have the exact dimensions on these, but uh, the the actual width this way of the bag is pretty much the same. Maybe there's a little bit of difference uh, between that bag that I just showed you. However, the actual height of the bag, you know, if you were standing it on its end, is drastically shorter than the other one. So I find that I can get basic equipment in this bag for a trip uh, you know if I'm going to a shooting class or something like that or climbing trip or something like that I can get most everything that I need in this bag gear wise um, you know I usually have to have a secondary bag for some other clothes and things like that, that I'm taking on a trip but gear wise and equipment wise this really fits the bill for a lot of what what I use and you know I'm very much kind of like what uh, gentleman's question was saying uh, I don't typically really keep weapons all the time in here. However, when I travel uh, with a pistol, I did wire this up. It's kind of a little DIY I can walk through on this bag too. Um, but what I did, hopefully you can see that, is I've got a lock box that's cabled into this bag. So if I travel and I check, or I'm checking a bag, I will declare a firearm at the airport. Um, what I do is I actually Let's open this up below here in this bag. There is like a rigid plastic piece and it's pretty hard. It's probably a good, I'd say quarter inch thick piece of plastic. And I drilled a hole with a, with a hole bit and I girth hitched this cable through it and then locked it in the box. So, you know, it's not the most secure thing I'll admit, you know, it's uh, it's not as though it's attached to a metal frame or something like that, but it's still kind of a pain. And, you know, like I say all the time, all security is just buying time and given an infinite time and opportunity, anybody's going to be able to get, you know, a firearm out of your bag if they're so inclined. So you're never going to prevent that completely. However, this satisfies the TSA requirements for carrying on a firearm. Um, and I'll do that with a pistol. If I'm taking a long gun or something, that'll typically go in its own case. I don't put long guns in this bag and TSA would severely frown upon that. Um, uh, I think so. Anyway, I always just have a rigid Pelican case or something like that when I'm traveling with a long gun or a AR or something like that. But the organization is really what I like about this bag the most and it's got the most organization out of most of the bags that I've had loadout wise. I've only, you know, used what, four? I mean, I don't have an, a ton of loadout bags, probably more than the average person, however. Uh, but out of the four that I've used, I keep coming back to this one a lot because of its shorter profile. It holds less, 
but it's still got wheels. Wheels are a big requirement for me with a loadout bag, particularly if I'm carrying it through the airport uh, because my rifle case has wheels and my loadout bag will have wheels. So, you know, with two hands, I can wear a backpack with my clothes and other stuff in it. And then I've got both of those in each hand pulling through the airport, which is a complete pain, especially if you've maxed out your weight capacity in a bag like this, as well as a rifle case. It can be a monster to wheel through the airport. Uh, I've done it quite a few times. I always dread doing it because I hate it. Uh, just because after a while, no matter how much you work out, it's going to strain anybody wheeling all that weight through the airport like that. So um, anyway, until there's a better solution around, that's, this is what I like. So this is the LB 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 LBT 2466A medium wheeled loadout bag. So, and it says with padding. So the padding is, uh, this is kind of almost like a laptop compartment, so it's padded on both sides. So you can put a laptop in here if you were so inclined. Um, this zipper here along the back wall is just an access part to uh, get to the padding because the padding needs to be inserted sometimes when they ship these. They'll ship them without the padding inserted. Uh, but then on the inside, there's actually four pockets. So along each of the, the side walls here there's a pocket um, and I really like the four different pocket organization system that's in here I feel like it helps me organize some of the smaller accessory stuff that I travel with in my kit um, and then I think that's and then the lid I never really wind up using these two pockets in the lid much even though I should I just don't I don't typically use them because my bag's usually so full that I'm struggling to close the lid on it and I say that with a caveat, it's not as though I pack it so full that I really need to go up to the next size because I like the, the size of this. So the, uh, the larger LBT bag is very similar on the inside, so I won't necessarily open that up, but I will compare it to this type of bag. This is also from LBT, and this was something that I thought would, would be a good solution for travel because it's got these backpack straps on it, like this. I know that's kind of hard to see here. Let me see if I can open this up better. All right, so this is the bag opening itself. And then you can see these backpack straps kind of tuck away. So you can undo that like this. You can tuck the backpack straps away and you won't really have to use them if you don't need them. But again, it's still got those four pockets on the inside, uh, just like the other LBT bag. It's roughly about the same I'd say overall size, yes, is about the same. And I think this is called the enhanced loadout bag, if I can find LBT's tag. Sometimes I can find them right away, and sometimes it takes me a second with their products. Anyhow, I believe this is called the enhanced loadout bag. Forgive me if I'm wrong on this, but um, it's kind of a, if you look at the, so the end of this, it's kind of a semi-circular shape. Um, and then there's actually a pocket here that's on the, the end here. Surgical blade, that's not good to have in there. Anyway, you can, uh, you can see the bottom has kind of a coating on it, which is nice. But however, when you put a, a heavy load in this bag, it becomes really cumbersome. Even with backpack straps on, if you have all your equipment in a bag like this, it's just really cumbersome to drag through an airport or anything like that. So that's kind of why I moved away from that. Um, this tactical assault gear bag is where I started with loadout bags way back in the day. Don't mind the cobwebs. And I really liked the organization that this bag had when I first bought it. Still like the organization. Because it's got removable options on the inside. I don't know if they still make this bag. This is probably a good close to a decade old now. Um, but so they have these removable bags inside of here like this so it's got velcro and you can see it's got these mesh compartments so it's almost like these these individual bags that you can pull out and organize with your stuff you know there's some that fit along the sidewall uh, one of these bags is actually what i still use for my range accessories so um, one of these holds all the the clips and things that i typically take to the range but I really like the, the frame, and that's what I kind of started out liking about this bag, because it, it, it does have a, a full internal frame that the bag almost slips on, whereas with these LBT bags, the frame is, 
is pretty much attached to the bag. So this is kind of a sewn in option. You don't really have an option to remove the frame if you needed to. It's kind of baked into the bag almost. So that's kind of the difference between, I guess it's kind of like the internal external frame with backpacks. You know, this is kind of an external frame pack and that's kind of an internal frame pack if that makes sense in that reference. But um, again, this was very big. I mean, it's a massive bag and there's nothing wrong with a bag this size. However, like I said, I keep coming back to that smaller size LBT bag. And one thing I wanted to leave off on is that uh, with helmets, if you're transporting helmets, I really like these OpsCore uh, helmet covers that they came with. So this came with a couple of my bump helmets, the fast bump helmets that I have. Um, and I really like this because I can store the, uh, the nods mount in this little stuff sack and then put my helmet in there and tuck it through and then pull this tab and it kind of provides some protection for my helmet. So wanted to give a little shout to OpScore on these. I think they sell these separately too. So if you have a helmet and you're looking for something like this, this is an actually a, a very lightweight, easy way to carry a helmet without having to have a full blown case for it. Okay, I was informed that I should clarify from the last segment. When I said clips, I meant binder clips. That's what I use when I go shooting, not like magazine clips. I know the difference. I'm not gonna call magazines clips. Give me a little more credit, right? Okay, next question. From comes from KCP on YouTube. Where can I get custom topographical maps? Great question, Casey. That comes up quite a bit and we wind up um, referring people over to an article we wrote that has kind of a, a general list of places that you can go to print topo maps. But just off the top of my head, National Geographic is a great place. USGS.com, I believe, or .gov, or .org, I forget, uh, is a great place as well. And then this past semester, a bunch of guys that were at our alumni conclave printed out maps from mytopo. Dot com, I believe. So you can check that out too. I saw the quality of the maps that they printed and they were really good. So I would look into that as well. We have a local place that we print our muster maps through called One, One Map Place. And you can basically send them a USGS quad and they will print it for you on great map paper and ship it back to you. I even think they have some waterproof paper options as well. Um, but the USGS.com has gov org whatever it is sorry um, has free topo maps so basically the way topo maps work is that they're the uh, let's say north america is divided into quadrangles so seven and a half minute maps are what they're also referred to as but each quad or quadrangle um, is its own one in twenty four thousand scale map uh, they're a relative similar size so when you actually are cross crossing quadrangles uh, you will have to purchase both of those maps because sometimes you'll be traversing between two quad maps. Um, that actually happened to us. Uh, we were actually traversing four different quad maps at Muster a couple years back, and we had to make a custom quadrangle map. So we had to take four different quads from USGS and mash them into the size of one quad, basically creating our own custom quadrangle. Um, I say we, but really Matt had to do that work, and he was... Uh, he was not happy about that. It took a very long time, so um, it's possible. However, everything has to line up perfectly and all your longitude and latitude still needs to flow correctly. So it's, it's kind of a, a nightmare to do, um, but I believe that some of those places will do that automatically for you. Um, so look into that option as well. So again, one map place, uh, USGS, uh, whatever, uh, <laughs> my topo. Um, and then uh, one map place, I believe. I think I said all four of those again. Anyway, um, I'm also kind of researching iPhone app options too for, for Topo stuff. So um, one of the apps that I've been looking into is called Topo Maps Plus. So this is something I've been looking into to, to kind of get a feel for whether it can replicate the uh, the, the navigation that I'm used to with a 1 in 24,000 scale map. So um, I'm looking into that. I will, I'm wanting to do a complete write-up on the app on ITS, and I'll kind of fill you guys in on uh, questions over coffee when I reach that point at which I'm going to do that on. But that's something to check out too. Um, again, Tableau Maps Plus. Okay, next question comes in from our Patreon channel. So Stephen asks, is it safe to use AA lithium batteries in an EDC flashlight? 
I find a lot of companies say don't do it but never explain why. Pros and cons of switching to lithium for all devices. Personally, I am a huge fan of lithium batteries, so much so that I have almost don't buy alkaline batteries at all. I think there's one thing at my house that still requires alkaline and it's like my weather station thing that communicates wirelessly with a, a screen that's in my house. So that's the only thing that I still have to buy alkaline batteries for. I've pretty much switched to lithium for everything. Um, so with flashlights that take 123 batteries, most of those that you purchase um, come with lithium batteries already. So I know that one of these uh, Streamlight Protac 2Ls, um, don't tell Streamlight, but I use Surefire batteries in my Streamlight. Uh, but yeah, these are lithium batteries, and I think Streamlight makes their own lithium batteries as well. Um, but I would have no issues running a AA lithium battery in my flashlight. If anything, I think it would be more beneficial as long as, you know, I don't know if it's the voltage that is what causes some type of batteries to take alkaline versus lithium. I'm not quite sure. I mean, they're all one and a half volt batteries, so I wouldn't think that that would really be the issue. Um, I don't know. I mean, I really need to look into that question, and I would like to know the answer as well. But from, well, from what I could find, I really couldn't find any kind of reason why uh, you would need alkaline versus lithium. So lithium are more cold tolerant. They will not, uh, they're, they last longer for one. That's why they're more expensive. Uh, but they handle temperature fluctuations better. Um, you can store them like one of the things that I run into here in our warehouse is that I store batteries here. And what's happened is I've found, I've come to corrosive batteries in the box that we store batteries in on the alkaline side. So like I have some D batteries over there that have corrosion all over them. I still haven't thrown away yet. Uh, but that's what happens with alkaline batteries over time. They can leak and corrode. And the problem with devices is that I've actually had uh, Kelly had a flashlight she kept in her car and it had alkaline batteries in it, totally corroded. Um, and I have a regular maintenance plan to, to change batteries all the time. I'm a nerd like that. So by the time I got to her flashlight to change batteries, they were already corroded. We wound up having to throw the flashlight away. However, I tried to like take it apart and clean it and I used CLR and a brass wire brush and all kinds of stuff and I just couldn't get it back to working again So I wound up having to trash the flashlight, which is horrible So had I been using lithium batteries, I wouldn't have had that problem even in the heat in Texas. So um, that's something that Has caused me to only solely use lithium batteries. Hope that helps. I know I didn't directly answer your question But hopefully it gave you a little more insight into that I'd like to quickly address some of the questions as well that we've got over YouTube and their new policies and what are we doing about it? Are we leaving YouTube? So short answer, no, we are not leaving YouTube. And the long reply is that I feel that YouTube has been a great content platform for us. We've been on here since 2009 and we're coming up on damn near 10 years on YouTube. I think their policies are a little misguided. Um, that's my personal opinion. I hope that they will eventually come back around and listen to some of the voices that are, you know, voicing opinions on YouTube on their new policies. However, I do understand what's going on. It's kind of a, a symptom of America right now and I feel like everybody abandoning YouTube as a platform is the wrong approach and wrong avenue to take because I feel like if we all do that then you know they've made their point and now we're all gone and we can't say anything about it. So I feel like if we if we more use our collective voice and band together and really try to understand their side of the story as well as kind of talk about you know what we're doing i mean it's kind of an irony and i've wanted to write an article on its about it too because there's there's kind of this there's kind of this pro yay veteran you know stuff that goes on but yet with these tech companies what happens is that they're honestly saying hey don't you know we we love that you're a veteran and we love that you serve a country but don't use any of those skills or the things that you've learned to promote on our on our social network so there's kind of this misnomer that gets floated around and I don't know I've wanted to just kind of write a uh, an opinion piece on that and this is kind of an I'm alluding to that in this obviously but um, I feel like that's really what needs to be done we need to kind of band together use our collective voice to um, to really lobby YouTube to say hey this is our stance and this is why these things already exist and why they need to exist on your content platform. So 
that's a little spiel on that. Um, as always, not to end it on a sour note, but use the Pound Tech Gear Tasting in our social media network. We will find your questions and get them answered here on the show, which isn't going anywhere. It'll be on YouTube. And where's I going with that? Hey, subscribe if you're not subscribed already. So we would love to build our YouTube presence even more. Um, your subscription will help us get our channel and videos shown to other subscribers of other channels on YouTube, so on and so forth, get our videos recommended, etc. Please make sure you're subscribed if you're watching this video. We very much appreciate it and help us out. Also, if you like what we're doing, please consider joining our membership as a crew leader. That link is below too. You can check out all the benefits that we will give back to you. Whew.